Okay. Welcome everybody. In, in behalf of the Philos project who sponsored this, uh, meet, this gathering, I welcome you. Uh, I really hope you will enjoy this talk. Uh, I'm really thankful for each of you for being here. I know it's nothing easy to, co to come as Palestinian to hear an Israeli Jew speaking his narrative to you. Uh, I really appreciate each of you for taking this time and accepting this invitation to come here and to hear to the other side. It's not, it wasn't easy as well for me to start listening to the other side, but with the time I start being able to recognize and see the humanity in the other and being at least able to hear them, whether I agree with them or not. Just for your information, everything here is off the record. Uh, the cameras is all only taking uh, me and you see if you want to take pictures of us, that's fine, but you cannot tweet or Facebook or anything right now. If you want to do it after one hour, at least after leaving this place, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Due to the sensitivity of the subject and also, you know, we are in a crucial, uh, critical situation in the, in the Palestinian territories. So thank you and we are looking forward to, to start um, our talk. So I'll like to start by introducing our <coughs> guest speaker, Yusuf Halevi, who is an Israeli Jew writer who lives in Jerusalem. Uh, Yusuf is uh, the writer of the, the book in wh which we will discuss today, Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, Rasail Ilajar al Palestini. Uh, this uh, book that was actually best selling in New York, uh, New York Times, it's a great book. I've read it, and when the first time I read it, I thought, like, it's really great book because I've seen, I'm seeing somebody who's in Israeli trying to speak, to speak to me, to my people, but at the same time, it's not easy book. It's a provocative, it's, it challenged my own narrative, my own view of the conflict, and I don't really accept everything that is written in it. However, I accept to hear Yusuf's, hear Yusuf's voice, and I replied to him by, uh, on the Forward magazine. I wrote this article, Yusuf read it, and he reached out to me, and I'm really thankful that you did. And this is lead that I asked him, like, I said, I went to Yusuf's office in Jerusalem and I said, well, Yusuf, you wrote this book and it's called Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor. And it's great. And it's great that you are touring in America, you're speaking about it, this is very good, but why don't you come to Palestine and talk to the Palestinians about your own letters? And Yusuf was excited about the idea, he accepted it. And I'm really thankful, Yusuf, that you, you. accepted um, this uh, invitation. So now we can, go ahead and start discussing um, our, our subject, the book. So, Khalil, if I could just say a yeah. few words before sure. that. First of all, uh, uh, thank you all very much for, for welcoming me. I'm, uh, I'm very touched and honored to be with you all. And I know, as Khalil says, this is not easy. It's not easy for, for anybody. And uh, I'm very grateful to you, first of all, Khalil. And when I wrote the book, I was hoping that this would, something like this would happen. And uh, I wrote the book, Dear Neighbor, not knowing who I was writing to. Dear Neighbor. And the book was translated into Arabic. It was published the same day in Arabic as in English. And it was put online in Arabic for free downloading. And we have a Facebook. Uh, we have a Facebook page and a website in Arabic. And my intention was, send it out. Just send it. Mm. And let God take care of, of the rest. And see, and see who writes back. So I got hundreds of responses. And um, many of them were negative. I when I wrote this book, I understood that I was walking into a minefield. Uh, I have a lot, of, um, a lot of people on my side who have attacked me or saying I'm naive or wasting my time. And uh, that's okay too. I, I, no surprises, you know. But I also got good responses on both the Palestinian side and the Israeli side. And uh, one of the best responses I got from you. And so um, when you came to my office and said, let's do this, it was really, I felt it was like a, uh, a gift from God. Thank you. Okay. So sorry, Bahia, but we'll go faster about that. So you will be a little mm -hmm. bit challenged, but that's fine. We, for the <laughs> sake of time. So I'm sorry about that. So you see, uh, when I start reading the first chapter of your book, you kind of drew this picture of your neighbor that they, they have, you have not only conquered walls that separate us, 
but more than this wall, an enmity wall. Actually, your book called Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, but some persons might, some people might object and say, in fact, we are not really neighbors, we are in enemies. So why would you choose to speak to your enemies? Why would you choose to not only speak to your enemies, but to call it Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor? when many people see both of our people as enemies. So um, someone here asked me a little just before we started, uh, is this your first time in Palestine? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was um, in uh, the late 1990s, I spent a year going through Palestinian society, going into, into Muslim and Christian society, going into mosques, into monasteries, uh, going to uh, a mosque in Gaza, in, uh, in Nusarat. And so I spent, I spent that year really trying to get to know Palestinian society. I was working as a journalist in those years, Sahafi, and, uh, but I really went, I went as a religious person. I went as a religious Jew seeking religious Palestinians. Muslim and Christian. I actually came, came here to, uh, to Beit Jala and spent time at the Catholic Seminary. And I wrote, I ended up writing a book about that journey. Uh, the Catholic Seminary is not in the book because they asked me not to write about. One of, one of the priests there said to me, if you're our friend, you won't write about us. So I didn't. Hmm. But um, I did write about my journey into, into Islam and, and Christianity. And I made friends in Palestinian society, people who were my neighbors, who I felt we were neighbors. And then the second intifada happened. And the second intifada um, was the cutoff point, the break, the break. Whatever relations Palestinians and Israelis had before that pretty much ended for me too. I had friends, uh, I had um, religious friends, I had uh, an imam, I had people who I, I really was close to and uh, it became impossible with the second intifada. And for almost 20 years since the second intifada I had no connections on the Palestinian side. Now, I live in French Hill in Jerusalem, in Al-Quds, the last row of houses. And I look out on the next hill to, uh, to uh, Anata. And I look at the lights. I hear the muezzin. When I don't sleep at night, I hear the muezzin at 2 in the morning, at 4.30 in the morning. And I, it's, it's in my, my house. And so for all these years, I've been living with my neighbor in my house, but the wall on the mm. other side. And I wrote this book because I wanted to start getting to know my neighbors again. So I wrote this book, and I sent it out, and, and Khalil showed up in my office, and others. And now you're here. And this is what I was hoping for. And my purpose is not to convince anybody of anything. Uh, my hope is that you will hear what these years have been like from an Israeli perspective. And I will hear what life has been like from a Palestinian perspective. That's my hope. And maybe I'll just say one more thing, which is that uh, I'm not a politician. I'm not a diplomat. I don't represent anyone. So I don't have the power to make peace. But, I, but I'm a writer. And a writer has a certain amount of public position. And so, and so in a way, I would say that I'm somewhere between a, a, a regular citizen and a politician. I have. I wouldn't say a lot of influence, but some influence. And that's important for me to say to you because I hope that whatever we discuss here, not in your names, I'm not going to 
mention anybody's names except for Khalil, who is, doesn't mind. Uh, but I hope to take the conversation that we have here and take it to the public. Okay. Thank you, Yussi. Yeah. You mentioned that after the Second Intifada, this wall that was built between us that has kind of hindered us from regular connection and uh, being able to see each other. But I want to go back a little bit bef to before the Second Intifada, to the First Intifada. Yeah. In your book, you mentioned something that was really brilliant, but at the same time provocative for me, that you mentioned that I learned as an Israeli soldier the, the strength of Palestinian national movement and, mm. its, uh, and the Palestinian identity. When I was a soldier in Gaza, which is yeah. my city, when the stones used to come into your head. So can you explain more how did you came to understand Palestinian identity? And to follow up with mm. this, you also mentioned that the denial of the Palestinian peoplehood and identity is similar to the denial of the Jewish people peoplehood. And if yeah. we can follow up in that, with that, how does an Israeli average person look to the Palestinian identity and nationality? Do they really agree with what you are saying or are you just kind of representing yourself on this view? So that's a really, really good question, Khalil. Um, so I, um, I was drafted into the uh, Israeli army uh, during the first intifada. Um, and I served in, uh, in Gaza, as Khalil mentioned. And I came out of that experience with uh, two conclusions. First of all, that there is a Palestinian people that is fighting for its identity, for its rights, and fighting against me and my country, but fighting for its identity. And, that, and this is a people that I learned to respect. Initially, I learned to respect you as an enemy. Uh, I respected 16-year-olds who were throwing rocks at soldiers. Even though I was one of those soldiers, and even though I got a rock in my head, I still respected the courage of Palestinian teenagers who didn't have guns. And I felt that if, if, if Palestinian society can produce young people who are ready to go to jail, ready to risk even worse in fighting soldiers, that this is a people to take seriously. And I wasn't alone among Israelis in the First Intifada who really came to that conclusion. I also felt that um, ending the occupation isn't only important for you, it's important for me, for my society. That's, that was the second conclusion. But I also came away from Gaza with, with a question, and that is, if we t were to withdraw to the 1967 borders, would the Palestinian people accept Israel's existence? Because as a soldier, I was in the back alleys of the refugee camps, and I saw the graffiti on the wall, which was a sword through a Jewish star with blood dripping down. So I came away feeling that we must have a Palestinian state, but not sure that it would really bring peace. When the Oslo process happened, I was a supporter. I voted for Yitzhak Rabin. But like most Israeli Jews, I experienced the Second Intifada as a moment that meant that the Palestinian leaders will never accept Israel in any borders. And uh, the, the question really that I think most Israeli Jews ask themselves in the Second Intifada is, um, was it all an illusion? And what I write in the book is that what, I'm, what I want to explain to Palestinians uh, is how Israelis understood what happened in the Second Intifada, not because I want to convince you. I, don't, I think that the situation between us is so, is so bad that it's not a question of, tr of you trying to convince me and me trying to convince you. But I do think that Israelis need to understand 
how Palestinians understand the Second Intifada, and Palestinians need to understand how Israelis understand it. At least to, to, to know that each side has a story here. Now, some Palestinians have said to me, why should we, we're, we're living under occupation, you're powerful, we have no power, why should we listen? Who cares about your story? Who cares what you think happened? And I think that if I were in your place, that's how I would feel. You're the ones who have to go through checkpoints, if you can even pass through. You live on the wrong side of the wall, and so what's the point? For why sure should, not why not. should you listen? And the only, the only reason why I would suggest that it still might be useful for Palestinians to hear an Israeli perspective is because the Israeli public has the key to the Palestinian prison. And I want that key open. Israelis today don't believe that anything will bring peace. Anything they do will bring peace. And that's one of the biggest problems that Israelis and Palestinians need to face. Well, I, I want Israeli voters to reject this government. But Israeli voters are afraid of a Palestinian state. And I think Palestinians need not to agree, but to understand so that, so that Palestinians can, can have some strategy of figuring out how do you convince the Israeli public? And one of the reasons why this is important for me to meet you is for me to try to let go of my fear. Because Israel is the most powerful country, that's true, but Israelis have a kind of a split screen in their heads. One side, it's Israel and the Palestinians, and we have all the power. And the other side, it's Israel and the Arab and Muslim world. And there, Israelis start to feel less safe. Before the Second Intifada, there was a majority of Israelis who were ready for a two-state solution. The Second Intifada destroyed that. And for many years, I wasn't interested anymore. But I feel that the two societies are holding each other in a way like this, and we're heading over the, the cliff. And I want to see whether it's possible to start having different kinds of conversations. Thank you, Yussi. So it seems to me, you see, that everything kind of started in Second Intifada and First Intifada. And mm -hmm. I tried to get you back to the First Intifada, and now yes. I will try to uh. get you back to before this, to the mm -hmm. crucial relationship and the core of the conflict for, for both of us, of how we see each other. As Palestinians, we see, each, uh, we see, um, we see you as the colonizers mm -hmm. of the land. Mm -hmm. And you see yourself as some people who belong here. So how is it possible? In your book, you argue that there is a way to get out of this, what's so called to reconcile the Israeli and Palestinian narrative. Is it really reconcile, like something we can really reconcile that we it's a great see question. you as it's a colonizer? A, it's a great question. I, um, I don't know if it's really these two narratives that our two peoples have, if it's really reconcilable. I don't know. It may not be. But I'm not sure that that's necessarily the goal. You know, when I, when I ask myself, I ask myself a very simple question, which is, what is this conflict really about? And I thought, and, and I thought of this actually after I wrote the book. Hmm. You know, what is the conflict about? In, 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 in one line or two lines, what is the conflict about? Which side is responsible for starting the conflict? For the Palestinian and Arab side, the side that started the conflict are the Jews. Because you came here. And you came here 2,000 years after you were here. And nobody ever did that. And it's crazy. And who ever heard of such a thing? People showing up and saying, we were here 2,000 years ago. And uh, so the, 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 the sin of this conflict, the fault for this conflict, begins with the Jews coming here. That's, that's the sin. On the Jewish side, we said that we always had a connection here, and we were coming back. And the conflict started 
when the Arab world tried to stop us from coming back. And so each side sees this conflict in the only way that it can. Mm -hmm. Because each side, and I believe that each side acted with good faith. Mm. If you read Jewish history and you study Jewish history, you'll see that from the way that Jews understand their identity, sooner or later we had to come back here. Mm. If you study, if, and this I say to Jews and Israelis, if you study Arab history, you'll see that the Arab world had to oppose the Jews coming back. We saw this as a return, and the Arab world saw this as a colonialist invasion. And I don't believe, again, as somebody who knows Jewish history and has learned, has studied Palestinian history and the history of the Arab world, I don't believe that either side had a choice. For Judaism, our connection to this land is the essence of our faith. Our faith, it's not just a national identity. Our, the reli in the re religious identity and, and the national identity are the same. So we, ha from our point of view, we had to come back. From the Palestinian and Arab point of view, you had to try to stop us from coming back because of your history of experiencing colonialism. And so, Khalil, when you ask me, um, can these narratives come together? Probably not. That, that leaves us with one of two choices. We can either keep fighting for another 100 years, and maybe your side will win, you're the majority in this region. Maybe one of the, sooner or later, the Jews will just say, okay, too much war, we're finished, we're, we'll, you know. Or maybe my side will win. That's one option. The other option is that we start talking. Hmm. Not wait for the politicians, but as people, we start talking. And we say, okay, this is the situation. We don't agree. We don't agree. You will see Israel as colonialist, and you experienced Israel as colonialist. I experienced Israel as the return of my people, and I experienced the war against that return as, as an attempt to destroy my people. Each of us experienced this conflict as an attempt to destroy our people. I won't convince you how I see it, and you won't convince me how you see it. And I, um, I wrote this book because I want my neighbors to understand us, and I want us to understand you. Not to agree. Mm. I really, I, I have to emphasize, it's not about agreement. It's about understanding. It's, it's different. To make peace, we don't have to agree. But we do have to have at least a little bit of an understanding of each other. Mm. And so I wrote this book to try to explain something about Jewish identity. So the main, I'd say that the main point that I really tried to convey is that the Jews are a people and a religion together. Because it is based on a people and a history, and a land. And so when, when I speak to Palestinians and they'll say, we have no problem with the Jews as a religion, that's, I hear that very often. And my response is that the Jews are a people with a religious identity. So just to give you an idea of how Judaism works a little differently than Islam and Christianity, in Judaism, you can be an atheist and still be part of Judaism. I would say that in a way it is according to the Torah in that the, the, the Jewish people begins before we got the Torah, we were a people. When we were, when we were slaves in Egypt, 
Mm. We didn't yet have the Torah. And so if you're an atheist, you're still part of the people, which is why it gets a little confusing about what is religion, what is national identity, and how does that, how does that work? In this case, since the track of the 12 tribes have been lost, so you cannot connect the Jewish people of today back to the people of Egypt who left Egypt. So if it's not about belief, then I think right. the, the structure will not be solid. So it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. We, we lost 10 of the 12 tribes. They disappeared. But two of the tribes survived. And our tradition is that we are the continuation of those two tribes. The tribe of Judah, which the word Jew comes from, and the tribe of the Levites, uh, which is, my name is Halevi, that's the tribe of. So you, you had asked me, Khalil, you know, uh, your, an earlier question was, people would say, you're not speaking to your neighbor, you're speaking to your enemy. And people will say that on both sides to me, mm -hmm. and, and have said that. One of the things that we have done to each other for 100 years is each side saying to the other, you're not a real people. And I feel that as if we're ever going to make peace, each side needs to tell the other, you have the right to define yourself. Thank you, Yossi. It's getting real more religious, actually. And since we're mm -hmm. talking about religious, actually, it reminds me of something you mentioned in your book, that you drew really a beautiful picture of the Jewish return to the land, and more specifically to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. going to the Kotel, to the Western Wall, and praying there. And it's really a beautiful picture to draw. But at the same time, Hajj Amin Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem in the 20th, have mentioned that because of the start of the increasing number of the Jewish coming back to the Western Wall, that Al-Aqsa is in danger. This notion of Al-Aqsa fi Khatar is still known until today. So is it really that Al-Aqsa fi Khatar, is it really that you guys have not just came back to Al-Aqsa, one of our holiest sites, but also you are seeking to destroy it and rebuild your temple? So can you talk more about that? Uh, are there Jews who are fanatics and want to do that? Yes. Uh, fortunately, they are a minority, a dangerous minority, but still very much a minority. I would say even among the settlers, they're, they're a minority. They exist among the settlers, but they're a minority. Because what's, it's very interesting, uh, because most religious Jews believe that the, that the Haram al-Sharif, which we believe the temple was there, we're not, for most religious Jews, you're not allowed to even walk there. You do have some now who are going up, groups that are going up. Most religious Jews will not walk, will not walk there because in our, in our tradition, uh, it's, it, the ground is so holy that only the high priest was allowed from the temple period, and ordinary people are not allowed to go up there. So most religious Jews will not go up there. Yeah. Uh, most religious Jews believe that it is our holiest place, but we are not supposed to go up there till the Messiah comes. Uh, for me, it's my holiest place. When I pray, uh, it's my Qibla. Wherever Jews are around the world, they'll face the Haram al-Sharif to pray. And I leave, I leave the fate of that place to the Messiah and to God. When I look toward the Haram al-Sharif and I see the gold dome, it lifts me up. I feel that Islam is honoring that place. Now, as a Jew, I feel that my responsibility is to control my fanatics. Most Israelis do not believe that we should challenge the Muslim presence there. The difficult situation is that there are these small groups who want to change the situation. Great. So the question is related, following up actually with what you said, one of the things that you mentioned in your book, and actually that I, for the last, actually, just four years ago, I've learned about that there is this beautiful history of the Muslim people and the Jewish people. In fact, I was ashamed when I learned that 
the people, as a Christian, I was ashamed that the people who used to kick out the Jews from the land, who are the Crusaders and then the Muslims. And in your book, you mentioned that Khalifat al Khalifa Umar allowed the Jews to stay here. So, can you speak more to this? Most of Palestinians, I feel, because of the struggle we have with the Jews, we, we tend to ignore the positive side of, of a Jewish Muslim relationship. And we tend to focus only on the negative Muslim Jewish relationship. So, can you speak more to that? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because on the Jewish side as well, there's more of a focus on the negative in the Muslim Jewish relations. Because probably half the Jews of Israel today come from families that don't come from Europe, but from the Middle East. And, um, and their memories are very bad of living in Arab countries. And so when you speak to Jews who come from Arab countries, there's a great deal of anger. But there's a whole history before. It depends on the time and it depends on which country, but there is a, there is a rich history of Muslim Jewish friendship. Uh, I, that changed uh, in the modern world. And another reason was the, the tensions within Arab societies in the modern, in the period of modernity and post-colonialization, tensions between the majorities and the minorities all over the Arab world. I've been thinking a lot about what would have happened if the Jews were still living in Yemen and Syria and Iraq and Libya. Um, they would have most likely have had to escape. So we, our generation, is living after all of these relationships were destroyed. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, that's not the final answer. But that's the situation now. And well, inshallah, there's a chance to start rebuilding. And Palestinians and Israelis have nowhere to go. Now, I could go back to America. I was born there. I grew up there. Most Israelis have nowhere to go. I think that this very difficult but intimate relationship that we have is, a, is an opportunity. If Israelis and Palestinians could make peace, I think it could change the region. And the whole region is broken. And I hope we can try to help fix something. You see, thank you very much. So it's from Abdullah in the back. He, want, he have two questions and he want to say it in Arabic and he wish if I can translate it in English. I, so you mentioned you're coming back to the land and I have no problem with your coming back to the land. However, I have a problem with the methodology in which you came back to the land. It was. Uh, a time in which you were gangs, you killed people, you displaced people, you killed thousands of people. And in a way that you displaced people, dis displaced people, and you kicked people out of their homes, that even if you, as Israeli Jews, have forgotten this, the history will never forget what happened to us. I'm still really learning how to have this conversation. Because um, the way that this conversation usually works between Israelis and Palestinians is you will say what you just said, mm -hmm. and then the Israeli will say, yes, but you attacked us first. And you In other words, there's a, um, there's a kind of conversation here that I don't want to have. So I'm going to answer how Israelis understand what happened and why, how I understand what happened and why. But I hope that you won't hear it as a debate. The way that Israelis understand what happened is that the Nakba would not have happened if the Palestinian leadership then had agreed to the UN plan which the Zionists agreed to. And the Palestinian response that I've heard when I say this well, is, we were yes, but you came here and you didn't belong here. Be After 2,000 years, you come back. Of course, we tried. We didn't accept. Because again, what I hear, uh, and I write this in the book, is what Palestinians will say is, 
if somebody comes into your home and says, I'll take three rooms and you take three rooms, but it's my home. I'm not going to give you three rooms. And then we start going in a circle. Because then, then, then the Israeli will say, yes, but we believe this is also our home. And then there's, there's, no, there's no conversation. So what, you know, my, my dream of, of an eventual peace agreement will be for the Palestinian leadership to say to the, to the Jewish people, we accept that you're here and that you have a history here and that we're going to have to share the land between two states and, and, that, and then the Israeli leadership will tell the Palestinian people we're sorry for everything you suffered and we're sorry that our return caused your people so much suffering and that's what each side, each side needs to hear that what Palestinians don't realize is that you have a lot of psychological power and the psychological power that you have is to tell the Jews, we accept you here. Because the Jews have all the physical power, but you have great psychological power. And the Jews, again, are the, are the power and the majority here, but the minority in the region. The Palestinian people have the power to make the Jews feel safe. And the Jews have the power to make the Palestinian people free. Uh, Allah. It was follow up on the same point. Ah, so if oh, it's, it's the a, same it's a point, follow up, yeah. Yeah, so we'll go. Sorry. So, um, there was an assumption that the Nakba might have, have had not happened if Palestinians did not resist. Uh, does that imply, like, with the presence of 700,000 um, refugees at the time, Palestinians should have accepted that partition plan? to prevent the Nakba, that was the right thing to do. That's the first question. Second, um, I know for a fact, and I saw pictures from my great-grandmother with their Jewish neighbors in Jerusalem. They were celebrating, both had newborns, and they circumcised the children. And that was in the 20s or the 30s. Hmm. They were celebrating together, both traditions. Yeah. I could see a lot of joy in the pictures. So that tells me a lot that, um, this has been a multicultural place and it accepted everyone. You know? mm. um, the problem, the, the main problem, and this is why I think Israelis feel not safe no matter what kind of peace approach they try to come to, because they refuse to recognize the right of the return for the refugees. And that will always, always, forever, even after 10 generations, will be an excuse to go back and say Israel did something wrong. Hmm. And for like for a fact, I refuse not just for me as a Palestinian, for Israel to succeed this way. Because this model will prove that bullying works mm -hmm. internationally. Mm. I can make here refugees, I can get them out, I can make a country, mm. and I can make peace. Okay, someone else will do it in five hundred years, two hundred years. I refuse for it to be recorded in history that bullying works. It's a very important point that you're bringing up because in some ways this is the heart of the conflict. So the partition plan, the part, UN partition vote was November uh, 1947. The fighting begins right afterwards. Mm -hmm. The Nakba happens in the months following yep. the partition. They're, they're marked on the same day, but the Nakba begins after be, the period between November 1947 and May 1948 is really, and then of course after May 1948 it, it intensifies, but it begins right after the UN vote. So the Israeli argument is, if the Palestinian leadership had said yes to partition, the Nakba wouldn't have happened. I, uh, yeah, look, you know, it's, we don't know. It's, ما, we don't know, but I think that, that if, if the two sides had accepted the UN partition vote, that would have had, it would have locked us in to a two-state solution. What? That it, moving the Palestinians who were, were for example, in Bab al-Wad, Jaffa, Haifa, to what's now the West Bank and leaving only Israelis there, 
So I, so I don't think so. I don't think that was the UN plan, Perhaps. but it's. But I, I, I don't know for yeah. sure. The UN partition map. Do people know the map? Because it's not the same as the state of Israel. It was smaller. Israel was, Israel was smaller. And my understanding of how the map was drawn by the UN was that areas that were majority Jewish were part of the Jewish state, areas that were majority Palestinian would be part of the Palestinian state. So that the attempt, if you look at the map, the attempt was made to minimize the number of Jews and Palestinians that would live in each other's state. Mm. So I would say that is, if you ask Israelis what their understanding is of what happened and didn't happen in 47, 48, uh, Israelis would say that, that uh, one, if the Palestinian leadership had accepted the UN plan, the Nakba wouldn't have happened. And I think. Uh, the, the point that it would have happened anyway, we don't know. We really don't know. And the second reason why Israelis, uh, I would say, don't feel uh, that the responsibility for the Nakba is only on their side uh, is because we were attacked. And wherever, wherever the Arab armies or Palestinian militias were victorious, Jews were completely expelled from those areas or were massacred. There were massacres on both sides and expulsions on both sides. Most, for the most part, the Jews won. Yeah. Well, um, the Jews won almost all the battles. Yeah. But any of the battles that the Jews lost ended in complete uh, expulsion. What the solution should be to the refugee problem is the refugees, the dis now they're the descendants mostly of the refugees, will be absorbed in a Palestinian state with reparations. With what? Reparations. <laughs> and the settlers will be moved out of the Palestinians. <laughs> the argument is that we have two peoples that each should have their own majority state. And if I insist that the Jews who are set, the settlers stay here in your state, and, and I still have the right, I, I will continue to build, you have your state, but I have a historical connection here. So I'm going to keep building settlements in your state. You will then not have a real state if, I'm, if I keep moving Jews into your state. And the same will go for the state of Israel, that that's the one place in the world where the Jews are a majority. Yeah. Let's have as much questions as we can. Different mm -hmm. subjects. It's only once a year that this is happening, or maybe if you see would like to come again, I I'm here I'm, I'm here I'm it. here tomorrow. But Allah so. another question. You mentioned that according to the Jewish identity, the Jewish identity and the Jewish people believe that there must be a return to the land of Palestine. Mm -hmm. So he, it's, it's a question with two angles or two, two aspects. He said, let's say that we allowed you to kind of come back and to have to like have like part of the land as Jewish because you believe of the coming back. Why did you, the Israeli Jews, didn't like say that's enough and you start expanding and expanding. This is first. And the second, you mentioned that it's part of the Jewish identity to return to the land. But is it true that all the Jews who are living in Israel today are really having this Jewish identity, or many of whom have came only because they found it, it's a good opportunity? It's a good question. I'll answer the second first. Every, you know, every people has all kinds of people. <laughs> uh, I came here because I was coming to my people's home, and I came as a religious Jew. <laughs> Um, many Jews from Russia, for example, who are secular, came because it's a better opportunity. Uh, your first question... Uh, look, I, um, I spent 11 years writing a book about the settlers. It's called Like Dreamers. And that book explains what happened to Israel as a result of the 1967 war. Again, you know, we have such different narratives. 
about what happened. The Israeli narrative of what happened in 1967 was that the Arab world tried to destroy Israel. We, we launched a preemptive strike and we found ourselves with lands that were the ancient lands of the Jewish. One part of the people of Israel said, this is our home. We won this land in a war of self-defense. Another part of the people of Israel said, we have a state. It's enough. I think that the, arg that the, that the, that the argument in the end is not going to be between Israelis and Palestinians. It will be between it will be among the Israelis against Israelis and Palestinians against Palestinians. We have, uh, actually we that, don't have time. To my mind, if we're really going to have peace, that's going to be the, there will be Israelis who will tell other Israelis, listen, the Palestinians have an argument that we have yeah. to hear. Yeah. And there will be Palestinians telling other Palestinians, listen, the Israelis have an argument too. And that, if we get to that point, if we get to that point, in, in the end, in the end, my argument is going to be with the settlers. Yeah. To Fatma. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for the meeting. The meeting is really great. It has a lot of great ideas. Okay. <laughs> and it seems like UC is giving all of his entire time to, for writing. <laughs> but his quest, her question, or her two questions and one question. You mentioned bees. Where would we start from for be, from bees? And what is the thing that for us, for what I have to do for the Israelis so they start believing in bees? It's a great question. So, do I write a book it's or a great something? Question. I actually would like to answer this too. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would love for you to write letter back to me. Uh, I should, I should, yeah, sorry. Look, you know, the, the book that I, I wrote letters to my Palestinian neighbor and I asked Palestinians to write me back. So now I just came out with a new edition of the book, which has 50 pages at the end of Palestinian responses. And I think, Khalil, I think you can, you can uh, testify that the letters that I published don't give me an easy time. When I told an Israeli friend that I'm publishing a new edition of the book, and I'm including 50 pages in the book of Palestinian arguments against my book, he said, well, I, I hope you're going to publish the weakest letters to make the Palestinian argument look bad. And I said to him, I'm going to publish the strongest because I want this conversation to be real. And I made a decision, which some Jews are not happy with, that I would give the Palestinians the last word. I disagree with many of the things that, that Palestinians wrote me in the letter, but I felt the need to honor the Palestinians who wrote me, who responded to me, and, not, and to give them the last word. This is the first book that I know of that has the Israeli voice and the Palestinian voice. But I have a website in Arabic for the book mm -hmm. and a Facebook page. And I'm publishing, as I get more letters, I just mm -hmm. got a five-page letter from, uh, from a man in Tulkaram mm -hmm. who was angry with me about, he read the book in Arabic, angry and he argues. And we, I asked his permission if I could take his letter and put it on my website. And so it's on the website now. Five pages. If you think you were provocative, believe me, you were easy on me. You were, you were really, he, this is really, you should read this letter. And uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is, I see this as an ongoing project. Please, I hope you'll read the book in Arabic. And I'll give you, we can give you all the link. And it's free, it's free download. If anyone wants the book in English, I'll give you a copy in, in English. But actually, one request that I get from most of people, they want an Arabic version that is written, not an online. 
you know, it's, uh, I didn't have the money to publish it. And I couldn't find, I, I didn't think, I, didn't think I would have a publisher who would, who would publish it in Arabic. If anyone here knows of a publisher, anywhere in, in, the, in the world, that will publish this in Arabic, I think I we can talk so about that. If who? you know somebody, where? let me know. In where? In New York. Yeah, okay. I think we, we can talk as. Ah, uh, yeah? As, okay. As philos. Let's talk. Uh, 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 I, think, I think we are done. I'm Let's sorry. Talk. Dinner, dinner we'll will talk be, over dinner. Will be called. Thank you, thank very, you all much very much for being here. We really, really wonderful appreciate to talk it. with you all. Ask as much thank questions you. as you